Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Annalisa and today I'm going to do a story time about my endoscopy and colonoscopy that I had a few weeks ago. Before I get started, uh, this the main content of this video has nothing to do with Palestine, but this is a kafia, um, and you will find lots of links below about how to contact your congresspeople, uh, where to find protests, places to donate, places to educate yourself, uh, Palestinian authors to support, um, places to get news updates about Gaza and the West Bank, um, in the description. According to Al Jazeera, updated as of February 21st, um, I'm filming this on the 23rd. The um, number of people killed in Gaza is over 29,000. There are currently more than 7,000 people missing. As you are probably aware, the people have been starving for months now um, as food was cut off right away in October. And the things they are eating to try to stay alive are getting worse and worse as they are more and more desperate and I will leave there down to one hospital over two million people and I think it's only running at about half capacity. Let's have a moment of silence for those people. In addition to just wanting to acknowledge that that's still going on. Since this is a video about me receiving health care, I figured that it was particularly appropriate. I'm going to try to lay this out for you on a, a timeline as accurate as I can remember <laughs> so that you can kind of get a picture of how long it takes to get things done um, in the U.S. healthcare system. So in one of my 12 days of Christmas videos, I mentioned that I had been found to be anemic and that might be why I'm tired all the time um, and that we were working on trying to figure out why. I found out I was anemic with a 10.4 hemoglobin. For reference, healthy enough to donate blood is 12.5. Uh, a lot of menstruating people have more like 11.5 because we lose blood. Uh, through periods but it didn't make sense for me to be even that anemic because uh, I have not had periods for a couple years uh, because I have gone on uh, constant birth control. So that was a little weird when it came up in my lab results that my doctor ordered in October of 2023 just because she hadn't taken labs from me for a year and so the year before, my labs had shown I was about 11.5, but when she saw that it was now down at 10.4, uh, she had her nurse call me and uh, warn me of that and, and like make sure that I was going to uh, go through with the appointment that uh, she had referred me for at the uh, gastroenterologist uh, because uh, that level of hemoglobin is, is somewhat indicative that there might be some kind of internal bleeding going on. Uh, and a gastroenterologist can check for that uh, when doing an endoscope and colonoscopy. The original reason I had been referred to the gastroenterologist was because I was suffering from acid reflux. And because of that, I was taking omeprazole, which is something that is best not to be on long term, according to my GP, because it can uh, harm the ability of your stomach to break down and thus absorb some nutrients, such as calcium, uh, <laughs> which is kind of necessary for your bones. And so it actually puts you at risk of osteoporosis when you are uh, otherwise too young uh, to have that be a problem. That was in October. I originally got my gastroenterologist scheduled for the uh, very end of December. 
about a week after we scheduled that we realized there was a scheduling conflict with our Christmas plans because it was for the 26th and we uh, called to reschedule and as soon as we could get in after that it was a full month later near the end of January. I continue taking my meds as I have been for the duration of this time and I go uh, to the office at my appointment and first we're seen by a nurse. The nurse was pretty great. Uh, then we saw a uh, resident, which a resident from my understanding is a doctor who has their doctorate, but now has to have like clinical type experience for a couple of years uh, under the supervision of a full fledged medical doctor. Um, before they can like start their own practice. I just did a swift uh, ecosia in, and that is what the internet says it is. He talked to us for a little while uh, and kind of took down my symptoms that I was experiencing and why I had been referred. And my mom was there with me because I require, <laughs> because I do much better uh, when I have a, a, f a person with me to do anything. Uh, but specifically, I highly recommend having another person with you to go to doctor appointments uh, of any kind. Um, if you can get a man that is uh, preferable um, for unfortunate reasons, but uh, any person will help somewhat just having two people to talk to the doctor uh, sometimes makes them more likely to listen than if it is just the patient self-reporting. I don't think we had any issues with doctors not listening in this whole situation, um, but I have heard things um, and oh also <laughs> we told the resident that I was anemic. He may have assumed that I was anemic because of menstruation, uh, because he didn't ask about that. Um, and I also told him about my gastric reflux and about how my family has it and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we also told him about the status of my digestion as far as things not being quite as they should be in that area as well. And he goes and reports to the specialist that I have the actual appointment with. Um, and he had spent a fair amount of time with us. Um, my doctor came in, um, my specialist came in and, uh, basically very briefly went over a few things with us and basically said that acid reflux isn't a good enough reason to do an endoscope, blah, blah, blah. And he was kind of explaining how we're probably not going to do this. And then, um, but I was kind of like deer in the heads, like, like, wait, wait. <laughs> and, uh, my mom was able to pipe up with, but she's anemic. Um, at which point the doctor like looked at the resident and was like, she's anemic. <laughs> this is a reason for an endoscope, which makes me think that the resident had not passed on that little detail. Um, and like, then he asked me, then the specialist asked me if I was having periods, if that could explain it. And I was like, no, I don't have periods no more. And he was, and he like did a little teaching moment with resident. Okay, if we have unexplained anemia, that means we should probably do a colonoscopy slash endoscopy. He didn't give us much of any details about what the endoscopy would be like. Um, he just said, yeah, we're going to do it. And uh, left. He didn't even tell me they were going to do it at the same time. Uh, <laughs> The nurse came back in to get us booked for the endoscopy colonoscopy and she was the one when we asked told us Yeah, they do it all at the same time partly made me nervous and partly alleviated my fears because now we're gonna uh, do a story within a story um, back when I was in nursing school I did a little uh, clinical at a hospital which I will not name um, but it was not the same hospital. Um, and I went on rotation with a colonoscopy person. And so I, you know, was in there and the doctor started putting the scope up where it goes. Um, and the patient started crying out in pain and writhing on the table, which is not supposed to happen. You're supposed to be, you know, sedated enough that that won't happen except when people actually talk to you about colonoscopy they don't say it won't hurt they say you won't remember it which does not inspire confidence as i recall the doctor did not ask 
to increase the medication he was getting he just told me and the nurse who was there to uh, hold him down which was a little traumatizing as far as me ever wanting to have this done to me if I was a full-fledged nurse maybe I would have felt able to say something but um, as a student nurse it's very easy to get kicked out of the program protesting a doctor's actions is is not a thing you can do safely as far as career wise but we're not going to talk about that because that's a whole rabbit hole that has more trauma involved in it relating to the fact that I am clearly not an RN right now anyway I had decided that I was never going to get a colonoscopy and I also because of research that me and my parents have done was not thrilled about my parents ever getting them because of the risk of puncture which is something that has happened to my uncle and also <laughs> to a, an acquaintance of my uncle and also to someone I know from church so while yes colonoscopies go on all the time and basically everyone over 50 has had one or two um that many just in my social acquaintance who have been punctured and had it lead to like pretty large complications um not thrilled about it so um i will try to find an article by aarp about that and link it if i can find an online version and there are also various companies who will check for blood in your stool even amounts that aren't visible um that is a safer way to catch possibly unknown problems uh that has been shown statistically to uh, be helpful and a fair amount of insurances will pay for it uh, and a fair amount of doctors will prescribe it because and I'll try to also find an article about that that like isn't by a company that produces them so you'll know that it's not like um so it's a little bit uh less biased um if I can find one of those for you despite me leaving information in the uh description and me telling you these things none of this is medical advice um if you want to know about these things do your own online research i personally recommend webmd and mayo clinic um your doctor will usually listen to you if you cite one of those as opposed to other websites um at least in my experience and talk to your gp uh, and any specialist you might have access to about these issues this is a personal story about my experience and my desires of what i want to do with my body with all of that background i was quite nervous the nurse came in and signed me up for these things and had me sign the waivers of like i don't of like I understand that all these things could happen but she didn't explain any of it to us or read any of it to us and it kind of felt like she was time pressuring us so I didn't have time to read it was a page full of fine print um and in the fine print it says you may be punctured <laughs> but at no point through this entire experience did anyone ever say that out loud which I found a little irritating because I know for a fact that it happens not just anecdotally but statistically and that whole appointment felt kind of rushed and it felt like no one was like willing to sit and talk with me through the risks um so I didn't like that very much <laughs> um but we got the appointment set up fairly soon which I did appreciate for about two and a half weeks later so and at this appointment we got told about SUTAB which you may have heard of um, a lot of people when they're getting prepped for a colonoscopy drinking something called prep um, that is the generic term for it what I had was also called prep but mine was in pill form which insurance will not necessarily pay for <laughs> um, but there is a coupon out for it so it cost us 60 bucks um, which I think went better because I have a very sensitive gag reflex and um, I think it and people have a lot of stories of it not going down well when it's in the liquid form because you can taste it more so I think it was better <laughs> that I went with the pills even if they cost a little bit and that was an option for me because uh, my parents have money yeah so we were told when to pick up the pills and when I got them from the pharmacy about a week before we were scheduled to have the colonoscopy endoscopy it had instructions on the box 
but I was told in the paperwork I was given at that scheduling appointment, do not take any of the pills or any of that before we've called you. <laughs> Just before the day of your appointment, the whole day before, go to this liquid diet that includes clear liquid diet that has this list of things you're allowed to eat. And I really liked having all these written instructions because I could go over them again and again and not have to stress that I had forgotten something. So I do appreciate that they are big on written instructions. The day before, which was a Wednesday, I get up in the morning and I have some apple juice that I had bought the week before at the grocery store. And I realized that I was going to be more munchy than I thought I was. I thought I was just going to drink the apple juice and the Gatorade that I had gotten that was in the uh, approved colors um, because they don't want any red dye uh, <laughs> in your uh, digestive system when they do this. I thought that would be enough and that would satiate me. But uh, it turned out I had not bought enough apple juice in the first place. Um, <laughs> to get as many calories as would help me not feel faint. So we made a little trip to the store and got some more things. Got some jello, once again of appropriate colors, and some banana flavored little frozen pops. Um, and I had those and that made me feel better than if I had just been drinking the juice. But I felt very sorry for myself this whole day because eating is life. <laughs> oh, I just realized I'm telling this slightly out of order because I thought I got the call on Wednesday. I got it on Tuesday. Um, the call tells you what time on your appointed day your colonoscopy is actually going to happen. And they tell you at what hours you are supposed to take your prep. And depending on what form you're taking it in, they give you specific instructions for that too. And they're different than the instructions on the box. So I wrote them down as she was telling me on the phone. And that was a little nerve wracking because I was worried I'd write it down wrong. Um, but I think I got it right. Then Wednesday morning on, I just had juice. Um, and of course for about 12 hours before that I hadn't eaten because it was nighttime. So the last meal I ate was Tuesday's dinner. So I had a bunch of juice and stuff. Uh, went to bed, got up at 4.30 in the morning to have my first set of 12 Sutab pills that you then drink three cups of 16 ounces of water with gradually over a couple hours. Now, I'm going to tell you about my experience with Sutab um, and it's going to be a bit gross and so um, involving digestive system issues at both ends. So if you don't want to hear about that, uh, I will put a time code either on the screen or in the description um, that you can skip to and that should take you to a couple hours before my appointment. I had my 12 pills and I drank the first 16 ounces of water at 4.30 a.m. Um, because that was the correct amount of hours before my appointment, which was at 2.15. So I was sitting up waiting and like reading a book uh, for an hour until I was supposed to start drinking my second glass of water. Um, and while that was happening, my stomach started gurgling and uh, I started feeling like I was going to throw up and uh, in fact I was trying to drink only water because my parents thought I was supposed to only drink water during this time whereas the papers I had said that I could have juice all the way up until I was nothing by mouth a couple hours before my appointment and so I'm still confused about what I was supposed to do in that area because of some things the doctor said um, but I had had nothing calorie wise up till that point so there were just a bunch of these chemicals from the pills sitting in my stomach and my stomach didn't appreciate that um so I expelled a couple mouthfuls I definitely did not get rid of all of the pills or all of the water so um at least there's that but I might have if I had not decided yeah I'm gonna have some apple juice because my stomach is angry at me and I think I might be less angry if it had some sugar <laughs> uh, and that worked it immediately calmed my nauseousness um which is good because I didn't want to not have all the pills that I was supposed to have um because they needed to do their job on my colon although I was having an endoscopy uh, upper endoscopy and a colonoscopy um 
the prep is pretty much for colonoscopies because uh, colon holds on to food for several days, whereas your esophagus pretty much gets rid of it uh, within a few hours. So if you're just having that for an endoscopy, you shouldn't have to go through all this. <laughs> Then within about an hour of my second glass of water, I started having diarrhea, very unpleasant diarrhea. Uh, compared to, I, for the last quite a while, I had been having <sighs> diarrhea that was less bad on the, the colonos on the gastroenterologist scale. He has a scale of wetness of poop. Um, and mine was uh, six out of seven normally, but was uh, seven out of seven once I took this prep. Um, and actually was even waterier than was pictured. Prep works, um, this particular type of prep is osmotic. Um, I was Googling all this while I was doing this because I was bored and also wanted to know what was going on with my body. So the osmotic part, um, rather than, um, various fiber things that like help your stool not to expel so much water in the first place or that just make things slip and slide easier. Um, osmotic ones go into your colon and because there is so much, um, I think it's a type of salt, in them, uh, they suck the water from your rest of your body into your colon. Uh, this can cause dehydration unsurprisingly so that's one of the reasons they have you drink a ton of water also so that there is water to be sucked into the colon to help flush it out so i find that i found that interest after the first couple of times it really started to burn um i don't know if it's just because it was wet and it was sort of spreading around or if it was like the saltiness or whatever was in the pills that was making it burn but it was thoroughly unpleasant and i started applying creams um, preparation H and uh, alternated with um, hydrocortisone because um, that's what was recommended on the internet when I looked it up. Started applying that every time and dreading my next trip to the toilet because both as it was coming out and when I had to wipe it burned really bad. Creams even though it ultimately made it better stung when I put it on. Um, so that was very not fun. And I took my second bunch of uh, pills a few hours later and took my water. And then once I finished my water for that, I was not allowed to have anything by mouth. Um, so I wasn't having any more water or any of my uh, calorific liquidy things. Okay, our grossed out friends are back. Obviously not feeling too good as I go to my appointment, but I prepare myself a little bag that has my phone and uh, a snack for my post-op um, because I am planning on going to dinner afterwards but you know the drive takes a while and I know I'm gonna be like really low on sugar uh, my purse with my ID and stuff in it oh I didn't mention that my that various um, at various times I had to give my insurance information and my name and my emergency contact about five times over the course of this hospital um, interaction between when I got referred to when I actually had the thing. Um, so I was <laughs> irritated that they had asked me to bring my insurance card to the final, um, thing, but the lady didn't actually ask for it. She just needed my ID. So I actually felt slightly less irritated after that. And I had my dad with me and, um, your person is supposed to, uh, stay at the hospital the whole time you're getting this done so it's not like they can go shopping and like be entertained in any way uh, while you're doing this they're supposed to stay there uh, my mom was at work um, and I was called back pretty much immediately even though I was early for my appointment so because they had people available to get me prepped um, so I left all my stuff with my dad to bring to me when I was finished uh, and I went on back and got handed over to a nurse and this nurse um, 
asked me if I had done the prep, if I had any problems with it, uh, if I had not eaten, all that type of stuff. It also asked me if I could possibly be pregnant. You know, standard normal question. I said no, with quite a lot of finality. Then he tells me to uh, change into this uh, hospital gown, which I am also nervous about because I don't like people to see my body. Um, even if they're medical professionals, I prefer that not to happen, at least when I'm awake. You know, I didn't have a problem with that happening while I'm uh unconscious as was going to be happening later on obviously um but i don't like that happening while i'm conscious so i was nervous about that and he also wanted me to pee in a cup um and also try to go one more time to get uh anything that might be left in my colon out of there um so I wasn't sure I had anything to go into the cup because I was a little dehydrated, but I managed it and uh, they took that off to do, I didn't yet know what with it. If you're experienced with the type of thing, you might know what they were gonna do with it. But then another nurse came in uh, when I had my gown on and was laying on the bed and uh, put an IV in my hand while asking a bunch of questions. They were very friendly, these two nurses. Um, they made me feel very comfortable and physically as well as emotionally. The IV felt like fire going in. I have given blood in the past when my blood was occasionally rich enough and it doesn't hurt that much. But then she taped it up and it was fine. Um, and it doesn't hurt when it's just sitting there. And then she asked if I could possibly be pregnant. And then a third nurse came in um, and was going over the procedure with me. This was the most anyone had ever walked me through the procedure of what was going to happen. Um, and still he didn't bring up that punctures were a possibility. Um, and he also asked if I could be pregnant. Now asking people a thing multiple times to see if their memory changes, definitely not because we suspect they're lying or anything, um, but because their memory might change or it might prompt something is, is one thing. But when you have taken the pee in the cup, whose entire purpose is to find out if I could be pregnant, um, when you've already taken that sample and you're not going to let me go into the procedure until the results come back, why do you ask me verbally if I could be pregnant? You're going to find out the answer anyway. Two people have already asked me that. If you're not going to believe me, don't ask. Other than that irritation, I really liked all of these people. They were really friendly and really nice and really helpful. I get wheeled in. And this part I have a small complaint about because the lady who was wheeling me in kind of treated me like a package. Um, she didn't ask or tell me ahead of time that she was going to remove the brakes and start wheeling me somewhere. She just told someone else she was going to wheel me away and then did it. Um, so I didn't like that part very much. But then I got wheeled into the uh, room where it was going to happen. Hello, the battery died and now it's two days later. So I get wheeled into the room where it happens. Meet the anesthesiologist. He is very nice. Um, I actually remember his name <laughs> and he was definitely unexpectedly felicitous um, for being a person with a medical doctorate. But I have pretty much only heard good things about anesthesiologists. Maybe it's because their whole job is to keep you from feeling pain without killing you during an operation. So maybe it attracts the type of people who are more like concerned about patient care as opposed to uh, power tripping, which can be an issue with doctors. As much as I am smack talking doctors in general, the GP I have right now is quite good. Um, probably cause she's a woman. But yeah, he was very kind and like making sure I was comfortable and like uh, I had to wait a while because the previous patient had a, a little bit of an issue that took a little longer. While I was waiting, they were all making sure I was comfortable. I had a blanket on. Uh, they turned the blood pressure cuff off so that it wasn't squeezing the death out of my arm at 30 seconds. And then uh, my specialist eventually came in, maybe 20 minutes later, um, and uh, explained why he was late and that he promised to take as good a care uh, of me as he did of the last patient. And then uh, they said they were gonna put me under. They finished putting the little thing in your mouth to hold it open because the endoscope was first, as I said. And uh, then they put the medication into my IV and it 
burned um, <laughs> for the few seconds I was awake. Um, that was painful. It burned all in this area. And then the next thing I was aware of um, and that I remembered being aware of at the time, because unlike what usually happens, apparently, um, I am able to remember everything except the actual procedures when I was supposed to be out. So um, usually your memories are a little, from what I've heard from other patients, um, your memory's usually hazy for a few hours after that. Um, but yeah, I remember waking up between procedures. They'd done the endoscope, now they're gonna do the colonoscopy. Uh, how I was um, told me that we were between and basically uh, were just checking on me before they put me back under. Uh, and then the next thing I remember after that is uh, I was in recovery. So they were um, checking my vitals, they were uh, giving me some fluids and then taking out my IV and then they were helping me to get dressed. I was very woozy at that point. <laughs> I could remember things but I was thinking fairly slowly and thus talking very slowly. I could tell that I was talking slowly and that my movements were clumsy as I was working on getting dressed. I had forgotten to take off my ring before I went in so they provided me with a little box to put it in. Um, before the procedure and the lady brought out the box and was like, oh, is this a wedding ring? And I wanted to tell her it was an ace ring because I love to evangelize about asexuality. <laughs> but I, I think I was too loopy to make that sentence make sense. So uh, I just took it out of the box and I put it on my uh, middle finger of my right hand. She's like, oh, it's just a ring. Was stuck in a wheelchair and uh, pushed out to uh, the parking lot where my dad was waiting. Um, I thought I would take longer on recovery and that they wanted to like make sure I was totally unloopy before I left But apparently that's not what they do anymore or at least at this hospital So they wheeled me out pretty quickly and by the time I was with my dad I was still talking really slow um, and he could tell <laughs> that I was woozy, but I remembered um, that I wanted my Cheetos that I had packed <laughs> So I got those out while we were driving to dinner um, I got to pick whatever dinner I wanted because I had been deprived for almost, yeah, over 36 hours at that point. Um, so we went to Red Lobster and I had my favorite, which is the linguine alfredo um, and the cheddar bay biscuits. And they didn't tell me anything when I came out about how it went or like any of their findings. And they, they did hand me a bunch of paperwork though. And when I got home, I opened the paperwork and found that there were pictures of my colon, which was uh, in remarkably good health. Um, there was nothing to be found wrong with it actually. Um, my upper endoscopy found something a little different. Um, found I had a hiatal hernia, which now that my dad has heard the word, he's like, oh, I have that. And your granddad had that too. And I guess that's what your aunt has. Thanks, dad. That would have been good when I was giving the medical history portion to the doctor. Um... I knew all these people had acid reflux, but dad hadn't come up with the words hiatal hernia until he was reminded of them uh, when it was in my paperwork. So if you don't like hearing about organs and their placement, I will provide another time code you can skip to. Uh, and once I'm done talking about that, I'll probably talk about next steps. Um, so a hiatal hernia... Uh, is where part of your stomach is in the wrong place. Hernias in general are when your organs are bulging out somewhere they're not supposed to be. So a lot of hernias that you hear about are when gets punctured or rips and your um, organs, your belly organs start hanging out through a tear um, because you've um, stressed your inguinal or around your pelvis type muscles. Hiatal hernia is where there is a hole through your diaphragm that the esophagus goes through to get to the stomach. And it's the hole is supposed to be about the size of the esophagus. So just the esophagus goes through and then the stomach is all below that. Um, and above the 
I'm just strain on my body, but you can't see because it's too low. But um, above the diaphragm is just your lungs and your heart and stuff like that. Um, and everything else is supposed to stay below there. So in a hiatal hernia, the stomach has bulged out through the hole the esophagus comes through. And so part of your stomach is existing up past the barrier of the diaphragm that normally prevents acid from going back up your throat. So people with hiatal hernias tend to have acid reflux like the people in my family. So um, other causes of acid reflux are just that you produce too much acid or that you have a certain type of infection. So next steps are as far as acid reflux, there may be a surgical thing that could fix the hiatal hernia, um, put everything back where it goes, and then I probably wouldn't have acid reflux anymore. Which leads to step two, if that happens, I won't have to take omeprazole anymore. Which means that the problem that my GP saw with me taking omeprazole, that it means I don't absorb as much nutrients, would be taken care of. So that's one of the next steps. The other is, I'm still anemic. We thought that we would find in the colonoscopy portion that I have either Crohn's or celiac disease um, because both of those interfere with the absorption of iron and thus the making of hemoglobin blood stuff. Um, but I don't. I have a completely healthy colon. It's possible that the reason I have anemia is because I'm not absorbing the iron because of the omeprazole and if I stop taking omeprazole that will be fixed. It's also possible that it's caused by something else. Um, so I suspect next step will be to try to get the surgery and then stop taking omeprazole, see if that helps, and then if that doesn't help, we will have to continue searching for why I have anemia. So for me, the next thing to do is get an appointment with my GP and see if she wants to refer me to get that surgery. So that's what's been going on with me health-wise the last couple of months. Thank you so much for watching. Um, if you have any kind of questions about this, about like what the experience was like, or um, how I made the decisions that I made, uh, feel free to ask them in the comments. And I will see you in the next video. Bye!